thank you for allowing me to be here. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, first, I wanted to start off with acknowledging what today is, being September 11th. Um, and just the impact of that day in our society, not just what we do in the United States, but um, how we really relate to each other, how we relate to other countries. And um, many of the things that happened today uh, were influenced by that. Um, I remember being in uh, college on September 11th, uh, being in class, much like something like today, and um, hearing about the first plane. And my first thought was, how does someone go so far off course that they would make that type of mistake? How does this happen? By the end of that class, people started, at least in, in you know, my area, or my class, started getting information about the second. And the rest of the day was spent, um, obviously very somber, and watching um, news coverage throughout the rest of the day and uh, talking with friends, checking on family and things like that. Um, so I think it's really important to one, honor uh, the people that helped, the people that lost their lives, um, but it's also important to comprehend how that day has changed um, us moving forward and someone uh, at the, before the semester um, made the great point of saying, you know, there are students at this university now that, um, or that will start at this university this fall that were not alive then or were not born then. Um, and so I think it's important to, to know kind of what the impact of that was as well. So um, if we can, let, let's, let's take a, a few, little bit um, just to, in silence to honor that. Also what I want to do is, um, that day was obviously very um, emotional. And everyone was, was looking for answers and everyone was looking for what do we, you know, what do we do, what's going on? Um, and so looking for people to provide guidance. And recently, you probably have seen this meme um, circulating around social media, um, Fred Rogers. Um, you know, the, the great show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, now Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Um, he had this quote of his, or that has at least been um, attributed to him, is circulating around the internet. He said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Um, to me, that is extremely powerful. Um, and we are at a place right now where we need helpers and we need to be seeing that and we need to be seeing we need to be coming together and talking about things and um, so it's very very meaningful for me for a number of reasons so that brings us to what my talk is about here's the title the power of knowing from someone who likes to think he knows a lot and let me tell you a little bit about <clears throat> where this idea came from when we first met about this lecture series, uh, we, we circulated emails around and it was, uh, a lot of people were on board with it. A lot of people really, really liked it. It was a great idea. Um, and then when we met as a smaller group to discuss different ideas for it and potential speakers, um, I found myself sitting in the meeting and, and, and wanting, having this urge to speak up hey, I have this great idea. And then I would kind of quell that urge. Someone else would talk, and it would be an amazing idea. And then 30 seconds later, I would have the thought again. I, I want to say something. I want people to know that, that I, I know what I'm talking about. I want to contribute. Um, and then I would decide to stay silent, and someone else would have an, another amazing idea. And so after that meeting, it was about a week later, 
um, I emailed Dr. Jones and I said, hey, here's something that I just observed that I think would be really, really neat for someone to talk about. Um, basically, the power of not knowing. And what that means is resisting the urge to always show that we have the answers. I think we live in a society now, and it, this is nothing new, but I think we live in a society that um, we're so quick to show how much we know and so quick to come back with a response. And sometimes it's just good to listen. And it can be incredibly freeing to not know everything, right? And so following that email, um, I said, you know, I think this would be a great topic. I'm sure someone um, has done research on this and, and can speak to this. Dr. Jones said, well, why don't you give it? I said, okay, I, I will. I'm honored. Thank you. As long as I can tell my story and to the extent of someone who likes to think he knows and likes to show how much he knows, but is coming to terms with um, the freedom of not knowing everything. And so that's what this is. This is somewhat my story. I like to use popular culture. So there will be a, some popular culture references in here. And I like to have a conversation. I want to have a conversation with everyone. So the first question, who knows? Or who do we ask? Who do you, in your lives, who do you think knows all the answers? Somebody share. Okay, dad, parents, someone else? What's that? Okay, President Obama? Anyone else? Google? At least the algorithm gets it right, right? Um, anyone else? Intuition? All right. So, Here's who I think knows. Here's who I think gets asked the questions. Most people probably know this person, right? Dr. Strange, who's Dr. Strange? He's in the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? He is uh, now the kind of keeper and watcher of Earth, making sure everything is um, copacetic here on Earth, that, that we can all live on it. Here's another person I think knows, Zoltar. For some of us, the reference is big. Um, for others in here, the reference is the, the recent um, insurance commercials where uh, Zoltar gets asked questions, unless he gets freed, because in one of the commercials, remember the woman sets him free and he calls for a taxi. And here's another person I think knows. Al from Winnie the Pooh. He, also, he always gets asked questions, right? They always go to him with questions. What do these three have in common? They all seem to get their knowledge from some higher source, higher power. Okay, they get their knowledge from a higher source or higher power. It's a great observation. They're fictitious, right? They're fictitious. And that is representative of we don't need to know everything. How many people in this world um, could we expect to know a lot of information? Even the people who are considered experts in certain fields or in cert on certain topics, they're constantly learning. The more you learn, the freeing thing is, the thing that I'm coming to grasp with, is the more that you learn, the more you learn, or the more you know how much you need to learn. What's that? Yes. The, the more that we, the more we study, the more we learn, the more we see that's out there, and the more answers we want, and the more investigation we want to do on our own. So 
So why do we want to show people what we know? I, I was introduced as having a PhD, um, being an associate professor of sport commerce. Um, I introduce myself at the beginning of each semester that way. Why do you think I do that? What? Credibility? Credibility? Oh, for recognition. Okay. So, yeah, some of it, I'll come to that second, some of it is credibility. So people in classes, um, I'll have some credibility when I'm talking to people about certain content. How much of it is about recognition, though? How much is it for me that I want, I want people to look to me for answers, some answers? Um, and then I become overburdened when I don't have the answers. You know? And I think to a certain extent that exists in everyone, that exists in all of us, right? We get a question whether it's in class, whether it's in a social group setting. Um, and we want, to have, we want to have an opinion on it, which is great, but a lot of times people also start arguing about their opinions and they know that they're right. And we know we're right and we don't switch or we don't try to see another path or someone else's perceptions or views. So here are some people who did that. So first, we'll, next we'll talk about the quest for knowledge. All right. So the reason Thor, the god of thunder, is up here, if you, follow his, if you followed his story arc, and by the way, um, how many Marvel fans are in here, or MCU fans? Okay. How many people have not seen Avengers Endgame? Okay. For those people that haven't seen it and you want to remain uh, surprised, and I'll give you a signal to cover your ears. Okay. So, if you follow his story arc, the first Thor movie, he was arrogant, right? He was arrogant. He thought he knew how to be king. He thought he knew better than his father how to be king. Um, so he goes on another quest and starts what amounts to a war between his nation and another na or his um, realm and another realm and is then cast out. He loses his power. He loses the ability to hold Mjolnir, right? He's cast to Midgard, which is Earth, uh, specifically New Mexico. And there, he has to learn, one, how to live amongst people he's not used to. He has to learn the customs. But more importantly, he has to learn to listen to people. He has to learn to listen to the people that find him, that are trying to help him, um, come up with a solution for um, coming out in the end, coming out successful, coming out on top, defeating um, the sworn enemy. When he learns to do this, there's a part of that movie, that first movie, where he seemingly sacrifices himself for his friends. He shows his selfless nature. That's, then he gets Mjolnir back. Then he is Thor, God of Thunder again. I look at that as there's also an interpretation that he not only has shown his selfless behavior, he has listened to people and he's learned from other people. And he has, more importantly, acknowledged that he does not know everything. Only then does he get his power back and only then is he equipped to be the type of ruler that Asgard would need. Okay, now remember I said if you haven't seen Avengers Endgame, and you want to stay surprised, now's the time to cover the ears or um, in some way try to stop listening. You jump to the end of his story arc. The end of his story arc, how does it end? He gives up his power, right. 
He gives up his power, his control uh, to be king of New Asgard. Why does he do that? Because he wants to find out more about himself. He says something to the effect of, I don't know who I'm supposed to be, but I know who I am. And I want to find out more about that. And then he flies off with Rocket Raccoon and um, the rest of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, so his story arc ends with, he started as arrogant, thinking he knew everything. And he ends with acknowledging he knows a fraction of what he thought he did. And that's okay, because that's part of the journey for him. And it's going to be a great journey, right? MCU fans? He's going to be in more movies, right? So you're going to be able to see him and his adventures throughout the rest of the MCU or for a long time, hopefully. The next person, someone we showed on the first slide, actually is Stephen Strange, right? He thought he was an expert. He thought he knew everything. He thought his life was laid out because he was a surgeon. He was one of the best surgeons in the world, right? When that was taken away from him, then he had to search for other knowledge. In his search to heal himself, um, he had to open himself up to other possibilities and other um, points of view. And ultimately, what ended up happening, he opened himself up to a whole new world of possibilities where he now, as I said on the previous slide, he now is the uh, protector or the watcher over Earth to make sure everything happens here the way we want it to happen and that we are all safe. So then next. So the first thing is acknowledging that we don't understand everything and we don't know everything and we have to be okay with that because it's fun. It's fun not to know sometimes. Then there's the quest for understanding. There's someone up here um, the, the quest for understanding, for me, was acknowledging that, hey, it's kind of fun not to know all of these answers, and here's something I want to investigate. Let's find some way to investigate that. And let's find some response to that. Let's find some answer to it. Does that mean that is the, the end-all answer? By no, by no means. But let's, we, have this, let's, we have this question, let's try to figure it out. Let's try to see um, what we can do to reach some type of conclusion. So my quest for understanding is constantly finding new ways to research what is essentially why one group treats another group differently. Um, we started out about 10 or 11 years ago looking at how rivalry in sport manifests and how that influences fans. Now we're looking at comparing how it manifests and impacts fans in sport and how it impacts people outside of sport. Uh, things like um, comic, comic fandom. So how do DC fans feel toward Marvel and Marvel toward DC? Theme park fandom. How do people who go to Disney parks all the time, how do they feel toward Universal? Uh, we're starting looking into other areas like politics, um, consumer goods, like cell phones, and trying to compare those feelings of rivalry in sport and out of sport. That's my quest for understanding. And does it end? No. And I don't want it to end. I'm at a point now where I've realized it's, it's more... Um, that I get more satisfaction out of the, the question and trying to find an answer than I do out of people thinking I have the answers. Because you know what happens when people think you have the answers? Well, they start asking a lot of questions. And you know what happens when people start asking questions? Eventually you get to something that you don't know. And then you're at a crossroads of, do I admit that I don't know and this is scary? Because even right now, for me, it's scary. Um, there, there are a lot of people here. You know, there are a lot of students. There are a lot of faculty. I want people to know that I'm important. I want people to understand that or think that I, I know what I'm talking about. What can I do to tell them that, that I know what I'm talking about? 
So it's something that you, you constantly deal with. Um, however, it's more fun to try to find that answer than someone to ask you and you have to say you don't know. But the great thing is if you say you don't know or, hey, let's try to figure that out together, that opens up for discussion and it opens up for um, great discovery. So someone else in popular culture who you could associate with a quest for understanding, Peter Quill, Guardians of the Galaxy, right? It's taken from Earth um, and in his 30s, he picks up his, we pick up his story and he calls himself a junker, right? He's, he uh, tries to find things and sell them. And by, throughout his process, he meets four other individuals. Um, and ultimately, he's always been searching for his place, for his purpose. So by meeting these four other individuals, and they by no means get along all the time, right? They by no means get along when they first meet each other e either. But by meeting the rest of the Guardians of the Galaxy, Drax, Gamora, uh, Rocket Raccoon, and Groot, he learns to listen to diverse ideas. And he learns how to um, cooperate and how to um, figure out problems with other people. And he turns out to be a much more full person at that point. At the end of the first Guardians movie, um, you see they're able to save the, the galaxy by holding one of the Infinity Stones, right? The, the only way that they could do that is by working together. So he came to the realization that he cannot do things on his own. He has to have other people to help him, and that's okay. That vulnerability of feeling like you have to have all the answers that didn't exist for him anymore. And then in the second one, he finds what he thought he wanted. Remember, his, his father finds him. He finds what he thought he wanted. And then at the end, he makes the sacrifice to, to not be immortal. He wanted to be mortal so he could save his friends and work with his friends. So throughout his story arc, he has that quest for understanding as well. Then another aspect is quest for acceptance. So first, here's a question for everyone. Do you want to know everything? You know, there, there have been movies like The Matrix that, hey, do you want to see behind the scenes? You take this pill and do you want to know everything? If you were given an option to, to take something and you have all the answers, would you want to do it? Raise your hand. How many people would? There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. So, for me, I wouldn't. Because one, again, people are asking you a lot of questions. And even if you know all the answers, you're still getting a lot of questions. Right? Um, also for me, now where I am, learning is the journey. All right, you've, you've heard the sayings that go something like, the, the, it's the journey, not the destination. Um, enjoy the ride, things like that. But for me, I understand that more and more every day, um, especially with two young children, because no day is the same as the day before, right? Um, and the old adage, you learn something new every day, um, really for me becomes every day you just learn you, what you don't know. And that makes it very interesting. So, I wouldn't want to know. Another reason um, is, as humans, we do like suspense. We like drama, right? Um, there are people in here who are in my graduate sport marketing class, so please don't answer this one, because we have talked about this. But if I teach in sport commerce, I teach sport marketing, and in that we talk about what is if you boiled it down to 
one attribute that made a sport a sport. So without this attribute, you would have difficulty, it's almost impossible to define something as a sport. What do you think it would be? Competition, okay. But there, you know, you can have competitions outside of athletics as well, right? Outside of sports. What? Rules? Okay. The unknown outcome. It's the unknown outcome. You think about when you're watching a game, not knowing the outcome, you, your range of emotions are completely different than if you're watching a rerun of a game, right? Sometimes it's more fun to watch a rerun of a game. Uh, I'll tell you as a, as a Texas Longhorns fan, it's pretty fun to watch the, the, the replay of the 2005 National Championship game because I know what happens, all right? But I remember watching that in real time and you're like, oh my goodness, we have four minutes to go. We're down by two touchdowns. How does this work? Where's, you know, where's the time for this? But in, in our sport classes, we talk about those range of emotions. And we like that. We like to feel that drama. Um, because in sport, it's safe. For the most part. For most people, it's safe. Now, Sport does allow rational people to react irrationally at times. Um, but most people, if your favorite team wins or loses, it doesn't significantly impact your daily life, right? Hopefully. For some, it does. But it's a safe way to experience that drama. Um, a lot more, uh, it's a lot more safe than, say, not knowing if you're going to make rent at the end of the month, right? That's drama, but that's real drama because you don't know what's going to happen, and that, has, that could have an adverse effect on your well-being, right? We tell another story in uh, sport marketing of the world wrestling entertainment. Anybody in here WWE fans? Okay, so up until the later 90s, early 2000s, um, it was known as World Wrestling Federation, and there are a lot of different, there, there have been several different um, wrestling federations and leagues um, that have come across the, the platforms. But World Wrestling Federation, one thing they did is it was promoted as this was real. The outcome was unknown. And it got to the point where people stopped watching because they knew there's no way this is real. All right, there's no way that this is not scripted. If you don't believe me, watch Liar Liar when uh, Drew Car uh, sorry, um, Jim Carrey tells his son, wrestling on, in the Olympics is real, Channel 3, no. So something happened in the late 90s and early 2000s. Actually, it was the World Wildlife Foundation claimed trademark or copyright over that, that uh, that over WWF. And so WWF had to change, and they changed to WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment. And at that point, they, so to speak, pulled the curtain back on it and said, yes, this is scripted. But look how athletic these people are. Look how entertaining this is. Look at how uh, drama-filled this is. And by the way, this is... This creates a soap opera type atmosphere that if you are not comfortable saying you watch daytime soap operas, you could be comfortable with this, right? Their viewership goes back up. Their viewership spikes. One, because people felt they were no longer being lied to. Um, and two, people could say, okay, now this is extremely entertaining. Look at this. And now I can watch this. I can feel this drama without um, like being told that it's real. I can enjoy this. So when we learn to listen and when we learn to listen to other people's viewpoints, their perspectives, what tends to happen 
is we learn how to be more accepting. And that's of ideas, that's, with, that's of people as well. You sit down with someone or you talk to someone that, that um, you don't know, typically you walk away, if you do it correctly, you walk away learning something about that person, knowing something more about that person. And that is a beautiful thing. What isn't great is when you talk with someone and you just, you're stuck to your position. And you know what you're saying is right. You know what you believe is right. That we, we, don't, we don't listen to other people. So the reason I say this is when you're in your classes, um, there are going to be times when you're talking about certain things that it's, o- it's okay to listen to other people. And it's okay to, um, if for no other reason, try to under- or understand some, where someone's coming from, if for no other reason, so you can coexist with that person. Right? There's a great political science book um, about, uh, from Nate Hibbing about um, the the biology behind why a person is, believes one thing or believes another. And his whole point is, look, you don't have to like someone, you don't have to agree with them, but maybe if you listen a little bit, you can at least coexist, okay? So more listening leads to acceptance. So how do we do this? What's our quest for acceptance? We started off with Fred Rogers, right? Um, Great programs about telling kids how to accept others, how to deal with things that are going to happen in their lives that um, they're not always going to, to know how to react and trying to help them react that way. Now, after Fred Rogers passed away, now we have Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Um, and for those of you who probably grew up watching some of Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, but don't know, Daniel Tiger's father was the puppet tiger in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So there's, there's the link. So these two programs really help to tell young kids how to react to certain things um, and how to accept other people. One thing that we've been doing, uh, and this is one of the, the few things that I'll touch on from, from our research, from my line of research, is we create comic books. We create comic stories that use the comic genre, the superhero genre. If you think superheroes um, aren't popular, go tell that to the millions of people who broke the in-game record, or helped in-game break the record for most watched movie, right? Or the highest box office movie, not counting inflation. Um, So we use the sports setting, we use comic books, and we use the superhero genre to try to teach different lessons to kids. Lessons like anti-bullying, helping others. So we have some on... um, Fan, kids being fans of the Boston Red Sox, um, bullying uh, one of their friends who's a fan of the New York Yankees online. And we have others where someone's being bullied in the schoolyard. Um, we have others where someone drops a hat, at, their friend drops a hat after a game, and they have to decide if they're going to give them their hat back or not. In all of these, in all of these situations, the kids or the protagonists are placed in opposing, on opposing teams. They support opposing teams. Now what this does is it represents basically just different groups. At the end uh, of the early stories, we started having Sport Rivalry Man tell people how they should behave. So like for the online bullying, telling, telling the, the two friends bullying their other friend, you know, that, that's not nice, that's, that's hurtful. Um, she, that's making her sad. And then they apologize and it ends with this moral lesson. Um, the, the same thing with the schoolyard bullying, the same thing with somebody helping somebody pick up a hat and give it back to them. 
But more recently, what we've started doing is we thought, let's put the power in the reader's hands. Let's put it in the kids' hands. Because this guy up here, sport rivalry, man, he's not all-knowing. We're actually working on an origin story of him now where the reason he became sport rivalry man is because of kids. Because he was someone who was, for lack of better terms, a bad fan. Would yell at other people and treat people from a rival team poorly. And then he was taught how to treat someone properly. So we started putting power back into the kids' hands. So now the stories are the kids actually make the decisions. The kids are the ones that come up with the realizations of how to treat other people with compassion. This guy is just in the background telling the story. So he's, he's no longer the Jiminy Cricket type character. He's now just the narrator, so to speak. And a couple reasons we did that, as, as we've moved, or as I've moved throughout my career and as we've moved throughout doing these, um, it's that realization that, hey, it's okay to admit that you don't know. You can learn from other people. That is the beauty of all of this, is you can learn from other people as long as you're willing to open up and as long as you're willing to accept another person's ideas and perceptions and try to have discussions with those people. So through these comics, what, what the hope is that we reach kids at an early age and show them, hey, just because someone supports a different team, just because they're in a different group than you, that doesn't mean you have to treat them inappropriately. You may not agree with what they support, but you could treat them appropriately. And kids are really, really good at taking something out of one context and putting it into another. So the hope is they take it out of the sport context and they put it into something else. The third hope wouldn't it be amazing if the kids actually told their parents how to behave? If then the, the student became the teacher, so to speak, that they could actually tell their parents, hey, we shouldn't be treating people this way that we don't agree with. And all this comes from being okay with not knowing. So let's kind of wrap this up. Um, I want to do a few things as far as talk about what all of this means and what I, what I hope you take from it. And then also, since this is the first um, last lecture, um, to try to give some, some pointers that I, I typically give in my class that, again, they don't come from, they're not content from a book or anything. They're, they're things that I've learned along the way that I really, really appreciate. So the first thing is listen, discuss, and engage. It's okay to learn. It's fun to learn. And hopefully, that's something you discover here at the university. And hopefully, you take that with you afterwards. Because a while ago, it, it was brought to my attention, basically, that you, know, you have a PhD. That means you just want to be a lifelong learner. That's what that really means. And that's true. As I said, it's, it's more fun to seek the answer now than to have the answer. And so for, for all of you students, that's what I hope you, you develop is this, um, this love for, or appreciation at least, for learning new things. Now, at this time, I also want to say, me telling you it's okay not to know um, shouldn't give you free reign to, if you're in a class discussion and you're asked something, say, I don't know. I don't know and leave it at that. Um, because that's part of engaging and that's part of discussing. Um, discussing with other people, engaging, and being open to learning new things. Get to know others. Perspectives and ideas included. Get to know other people. One of the, the great things about the Honors College and the Honors Forums to me is every semester I ask my students what their majors are. And I always get at least seven different responses or seven different areas. I said, you know, this is, these are what, this is one reason we have these classes. So you're meeting people from different backgrounds. 
um, different areas of study that you may not have met otherwise if it would not have been for a class like this. And because they're in a smaller setting, it's not the, the typical general education class and the size that accompanies that, um, you're more free to have discussion with people. It, it's less intimidating to have discussion with people. You know, another purpose to me of the forums is to see your professors in a different light. We have different interests. Um, as Dr. Jones said, I, I teach on um, rivalry in sport and what that means, um, but I also teach a class being called Being a Fan of Disney. And what does that mean? And it's basically a fandom class. But we, we talk about Disney and we talk about, you know, what it is that we like about that and then try to find ways to take that in other places, other areas of our lives. Um, so hopefully it gives you a different perspective on your professors as well. The third, you seek out knowledge. You being at the University of Memphis, you're going to leave here knowing a lot more than you did when you came in, right? You're going to have a lot more content knowledge than when you came in. But seeking out knowledge isn't just what you learn in the classroom. It, it in some ways, is, is learning how to be an adult, learning how to make decisions. Um, but within a campus setting, it's also seeking out people that have the same interest as you. Because all of your interests in here, as diverse as they are, there's probably someone on this campus who has studied something about that or can put you in touch with someone who can share more ideas and more knowledge about that area. So don't be afraid to um, ask people questions. And if there's something that interests you, don't be afraid to approach your professors, approach other students, approach administrators and ask these questions because that is the attainment of knowledge. And to me, the, the most important thing you can get from a university is that appreciation for being a lifelong learner. We talk about it here at the university, right? But a lifelong learner is someone who literally wants to spend their life gaining new information and finding new questions to ask and trying to find ways to answer those questions for themselves. And then have fun. Enjoy learning, right? You're going to have fun at the university um, if you allow yourself to. You're going to enjoy getting to know people. You're going to enjoy um, learning some of the content that you're going to learn, right? Allow yourself to enjoy it because it really is a lot of fun and it's really beautiful if you get to that place where you can allow yourself to say, I don't know everything. I'm perfectly fine with not knowing everything. I just want to learn more. Thank you very much. If anyone has questions. <laughs>